Hi, I'm Tim O'Reilly, the founder and CEO of O'Reilly Media, and I'm here with Dave Campbell, who's a technical fellow at Microsoft working in the database area. I met Dave uh, last year uh, in a meeting where I was getting uh, some briefing on some future initiatives mm -hmm. at Microsoft in that area, and I was just so excited uh, to hear how he was thinking, because I watch technology from the cheap seats, and I'm kind of doing pattern recognition from a distance, and I've been talking for years about data as operating system. And then Dave starts talking and go, oh, here's a guy who's actually making what I've been talking about. So uh, I really wanted to have Dave talk a little bit about the work uh, that uh, he's been doing and the group he's in has been doing because it seems to me like uh, uh, a group that really gets it. <laughs> so uh, maybe simple. Dave, maybe you can tell us, just start from the top of what it is you're doing. Sure, I mean, Tim, I've been doing sort of data and database stuff for 25 years or so. And I always take a look at where's the value moving to. And it occurred to me over the last three to five years that the value is moving to the data itself and yeah. our ability to recombine it. How do we refine it? How do we combine it in different ways? And uh, just see people sort of turn things inside out from having data be locked behind applications to be front and center. Yeah. Well, it seemed to me, I mean, it was, it was interesting. When I wrote my What is Web 2.0 paper, the piece that, I think most people overlooked at first was the line, data is the new Intel inside. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, the notion that you had these massive data subsystems that mm -hmm. were effectively being assembled into a kind of operating system. Uh, you know, you think about location, identity, and yep. so on, and you can, you can start to see that. And, you know, when I first started talking about it, everybody thought I was nuts. But, you know, now, of course, you walk around with a phone and you realize, well, Exactly. What is the operating system of some yeah. of those apps that you're using exactly. on your phone? It's somewhere in the cloud. There's a big database right. subsystem driving, you know, your location, your identity, right. your communications. So, but the idea that it's an operating system is a bit far-fetched uh, at, at first. But mm -hmm. it seems to me that using it as an analogy, you do start to think uh, interestingly about the future. Sure. So can you sure. tell us a little bit about... Uh, you know, what your thoughts are on that? Well, in terms of an analogy, I think one good thing, if you go back and you think about before we had uh, printer drivers all aligned behind a particular service abstraction, yeah. every application came with its own printer drivers and whatnot, right. and then the operating system provided that as a facility. You think about location. Yeah. For the last 10 years or so, every application's done its location, but you can imagine location services now becoming part of this data operating system. Reference data becoming part of this data operating yeah. system. So service abstractions, uh, that everyone can then build upon, I think, or keep part right. of it in a good analogy. Uh, it seems to me also, though, as we look at um, you know those kinds of data services, there's the first generation, which is just you know where are you, right. you know? uh, but you start thinking about higher level uh, yeah. services where you'd say, oh, okay, you know, say traffic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're actually going to reroute you dynamically exactly. based on uh, traffic rather than. We're going to, you know, and the fact is we're going to know about traffic because we're getting lots of data from connected cell phones yep. and so on and so forth. And so in real time, we'll have a feedback loop. So you can imagine the data subsystem, even something that seems really fairly well developed now, right. becoming much more sophisticated, much more useful to application developers. Right. Absolutely. I mean, it started with reference data, what sorts mm -hmm. of things static, and then sort of what sort of feeds, dynamic feeds. But the thing you just touched on in terms of uh, planning and routing, mm -hmm. more and more things going to online algorithms. So one example I've been using lately in this space, which kind of I think is interesting, is imagine there are a bunch of people at a game. Mm -hmm. 20,000 people going to drive away. If you can see across all of that, uh, you don't want to pick the same optimal route for everybody and send all 20,000 to the same place. So the ability to aggregate across both in terms of observation so really and then point. in terms of planning, I think, is you know, really I interesting. I've never thought about that. Yeah. That is really interesting. Okay. Actually, I was just reading something about uh, you know kind of the French uh, system of railroads uh -huh. where they had the central plan version and yep. everything radiated from yep. Paris, and they thought this was much better than the hodgepodge that everybody had before, yep. but it turned out in World War II that they had all these bottlenecks. Yep. And uh, it's kind of interesting because that kind of the internet architecture again, yeah, you know, yeah. that we kind of want flooding routing. Exactly, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, uh, very interesting, swarming yep. uh, to the, for the win. Uh, so, but practically, how are you thinking about this for developers and where yeah. are you in this process of, yeah, of thinking question. this through? So, it, things are changing for developers and how do we make these available as services? And I think mm -hmm. the, a good way I walk through it with customers is to talk about the progression from when we first had 
uh, information technology applications. And the yeah. data was behind the application. Yeah. And the first class of higher level services, reporting, analytics, and such, they were behind the application as well. Yeah. But you go 10, 15 years ago, the database vendors started to provide uh, reporting, they started to provide synchronization, replication, other sorts of services. So I, that's sort of the first generation, sort yeah. of the machinery of the data. And then the next generation, of, you know, how do we reason about the data itself? Yeah. And yeah. that's sort of the evolution and the yeah. progression and just walking people through that. Yeah. So for developers, uh, the ability to basically discover, combine and refine mm -hmm. data into new forms and if you go look at most of the compelling new apps, uh, they have some element of just yeah. you know connecting to something. It's about context mm -hmm. uh, and how do we incorporate various forms of context to produce yeah. great experiences. So uh, when we think about context, uh, there are a lot of uh, ways to frame things. Mm -hmm. You know, you can you can think of context by type of device. Mm -hmm. You can think of context by uh, type of. Uh, of market, you can yep. also think of context, you know, as a set of things like location, right. uh, social, uh, time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even things like, uh, you know, weather or right. you know, kind of like weather. You know, the, I've been really fascinated lately by the notion of using accelerometer data as a key to thinking a lot about getting context for the user. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, are they in the same place or are they moving? Right. You know, adjusting apps. Right. You know. Um, you know, there's all kinds of, of new data streams that we can start to use to key off of and say, oh yeah, wait, wait, let's think differently exactly. about the user experience. But there's also sort of market context. You know, mm -hmm. so when I think about this notion of data as operating system, you can think about it one way if you're talking about, say, well, what are we doing to support mobile apps? Mm -hmm. And uh, you think of it a different way if you're saying, well, what are we doing to support retailers and their supply chains, yep. or uh, you know, or manufacturers and their supply chains, mm -hmm. or what are we, how are we thinking about it for um, you know healthcare? Yep. So I guess the question is, how are you guys thinking about yeah, it? I mean, wh what, what are those, some of those areas that you're kind of trying to build a yeah. next-gen infrastructure for? So lots of interesting thoughts there. I mean, with respect to the context itself, you started in. in I started thinking about dimensionalizing it. I gave mm -hmm. a talk to uh, some friends at Microsoft Research a couple years ago that I called contextual computing. Mm -hmm. And I started by just breaking down sort of the base dimensions around location, around various sorts of things, time. So I think you know, time and space become very interesting sort of primitive types in this new world. And then above that, how do you do what I've been calling information production to get things mm -hmm. of a different form? So how do I use the accelerometer in my phone to determine whether I'm jogging, whether I'm sitting or not? Uh, I've been carrying around a GPS data logger mm -hmm. for a year or so, and I, yeah. I compute when I'm home or when I'm at work. And then mm -hmm. I combine that with when I send email, and I can, yeah. you know, how much mail do I send when I'm home or yeah. work? My wife was watching this. I haven't shown her that one yet. But yeah. So that's the next step up. Uh, no, it's really a really good point. It's sort of like the production of synthetic data uh, you know, that mm -hmm. it really comes from some combination. Why do you have to work at the lowest level? Right. You know, and it, and it changes UI. I mean, uh, the example I got from uh, Sam Liang at Alohar Mobile was, you know, why does RunKeeper, you know, require you to tell, right, uh, you know, the app when you started running mm -hmm. and when you stopped, when your phone right. already knows that. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, and it's sort of interesting, you know, you just think differently about the affordances that we get from sensors, for exactly. example, today. Yeah. In the, in the ability to, to do this interesting transformation from one information domain to another, mm -hmm. go from the accelerometer to my activities. That's right. You know, different classes and events That's and right. states. That's right, you can start to yeah. identify. And again, that kind of it brings us back to the operating system notion because it's about higher levels of abstraction exactly. which allow yep. developers yep. to be more efficient because somebody's figured out a bunch of plumbing. Yeah, yeah. But I want to come back to this notion of, of sort of you know, business domains yep. and contexts. Yep. You know, so like if you look at it, if, and this is from maybe horse race kind of mm -hmm. handicapping, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to say, okay, so here's Google with their their yep. mobile stack, you know, behind Android and yep. their app space and their mm -hmm. effectively their data OS. You've got Apple yep. building theirs and you've got Microsoft and Nokia yep. partnering on yep. another one. Uh, that are not interoperable. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to kind of see that as the main horse race. And mm -hmm. it's certainly a, a, a pretty big yep. one today. But it also seems to me there are a whole lot of other areas mm -hmm. that are in play. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, they're right now much where Microsoft is much stronger, right. you know, in say business computing. Yep. And so could we think about that 
for a bit. Like, what kinds of of things are people doing with data in you know in business mm -hmm. that's changing the fundamental nature of business applications? Well, a, actually, here's the. This way I haven't shared with you before, I don't think. I start many of my big data talks from mm -hmm. experience I had with some folks at a large commercial airline a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And these were enterprise architects. We were chatting about, you know, sort of the plight of the airline industry. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about transactional systems. And all of a sudden one of the architects puts his head in his hand and he said, you know, our business is horrible. We're just killing each other. Everyone wants just the lowest price. And he paused and he said, we've come to realize that the only way we're going to survive is to do a better job of yield management a better job of fuel management, and a better job of selling ancillary things to our customers than our competitors. Mm -hmm. And he said, that all requires us to do new things with data that we don't know how to do today. Yeah. So if you think about where are they going to get the pricing information for fuel futures? Where are they going to determine, you know, hey, there's a big storm coming. That's right. What do we do with the fleet? So this whole you know, right. notion, and, and for many of these businesses, it's becoming sort of the yeah. difference you know, between success or not. Uh, digital commerce, optimization yeah. there. So. Now we're doing some work with the CRM team to say, how do we take the various social feeds that we have, say, in Bing, and turn it into sentiment scoring mm -hmm. so that I have a set of terms that I'm interested in and I can follow. And uh, you know, it, a lot of things, a lot of applicability to business. And the conversation that I've had in the big data space in two years with a lot mm -hmm. of the CIOs has just yeah. been fascinating how much it shifted. 18 to 24 months ago, they were, what is this big data thing and do we have to worry about it? And right. the last six to nine months, you know, three out of four of the conversations are, hey, I know I need to get going here. How do I, how do, yeah. I do it? Well, the thing that I found interesting in our conversation uh, last year was you started talking about, for example, opening up APIs to developers yep. to some yep. of these, these yes. services. So yes. can you kind of give us a rundown of yeah. some of what's available? Yeah. And so we've got this thing we call the data market, mm -hmm. um, which a couple of folks and myself kind of pushed for a few years ago. And it's, it you know, wraps back around to your question that what is the what are the conditions in which this thing's really going to take off? Mm -hmm. How do we take friction out of certain things yeah. and have the content be compelling enough? Mm -hmm. So that we have a lot of uh, reference data now. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of government data yeah. and you know open data mandates and such. Yeah. So we're trying to facilitate some things there. By the way, I just want to uh, interrupt there. One of the things that uh, uh, in government space, I've been trying to encourage government people to do. It's not just consume uh, data from mm -hmm. you know outside services yeah. more effectively. But also to be a better provider, and yep. you know, there's a fundamental shift when you start thinking about this data as platform uh, to figuring out well who's already got the users. Mm -hmm. you know, and so a good example of that when I was working with Todd Park when he was CTO at HHS, uh, there's this HHS hospital mm -hmm. compare data set mm -hmm. they've been accumulating for years, mm -hmm. quality survey data, yep. so on. And I was like, well, you know, how many people go to the HHS website and find this? Why don't you see if we can reach out to people at you know, Google and Microsoft to use right. it in the search engine. And I was really excited to have Microsoft take us up on that. Yep. So it now helps power, you know, the hospital and nursing home yeah. search in Bing. And I think that's kind of the part of the thinking of the future, not yeah. just for everybody to start saying, well, here is my unique data that I have. How right. can I make it available to exactly. other developers? Exactly. And how can I get it in front of more users rather than, oh, I'm going to build my own app, my right. own right. You know, site. It's the old portal thinking yep. recreated in yep. app space. Yep. You know? Exactly. <laughs> it's like, you know, sometimes just coming up with a great data format, you know, a GTFS, great yep. example. You know, once you got a few cities going on it, you know, it becomes sort of fuel for everybody to, right. have, to up right. the level. And that's what yeah. I want to see happen. Well, it's interesting. So much of this, I think, is about taking friction yeah. out of the system in the yeah. large. And I think yeah. an example you and I have both used is this notion of zip codes. Yeah. How often do we have to go and you give someone both zip code, city, and state? Yeah, I and know. It's, yeah. it's crazy, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, and yeah. but uh, it, it just speaks to the friction. Yeah. Because yeah. it's there's a authority who owns the data. It's public data. Yeah. yeah. It, they clean it, but it's just the distribution friction that yeah, causes it's just all not things. really there. Yeah. You yeah. Kind of, actually, I remember think you, you kind of want to be able to join to some set of tables yeah. in the cloud. Yeah. You know. And, and that's part of the vision yeah. to make it really yeah. easy for developers to yeah. discover that, just yeah. to be able yeah. to incorporate it in the app. And so yeah. we've been doing some things. You know, it's great to get on sort of this learning cycle. We did some work to make it easy to consume in a bunch of apps. Then we realized there are a whole bunch of data sets that get updated periodically. So zip codes are a great example. They don't change all that often. What's really the low overhead, low overhead protocol for me to go and figure out if anything's changed and yeah, you know, incorporate exactly. in the app? So. Yeah, so but kind of going back, I, I took you off your, I asked you a question and I got yeah. excited and <laughs> I took you off the, uh, so you were starting to talk about the data market and right. what kind of stuff is in there. Yeah, so we've got in there, as I started, the reference data, other forms. 
But it's beyond data. The other thing I think that is sort of the next step up are models and services. Mm -hmm. And you know, at some point maybe we'll start talking about data scientists and whatnot. But mm -hmm. who are these rare people who can you know take this data and turn it into other valuable information? So and concrete, more more concrete. Give me some examples of. So there's yeah. a frankly one of the services that's uh, being most used right now is this Bing translation service. Mm -hmm. So by using statistical machine learning over the uh, corpus that we have. We produced a translation service that allows you to translate from one language to another. Right. And so that's one of the services. Uh, with respect to the data, much of the public data um, is, you know, there's a lot of really interesting public data sets that we have up there, so people consuming them. Mm -hmm. So this open protocol we call OData, mm -hmm. uh, which yeah, are right. extensions to Atom uh, and AtomPub. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that kind of come, brings up this notion of services. Uh, you know, if you look at the competitive landscape, uh, you know, how do you handicap yourself against other big data players yeah. at actually providing these things as information services for developers. That's, yeah, we could spend a lot of time on that. I spent a lot of time thinking about this, and, um, and how can we get better at that? I guess as yeah, well. it's a, as opposed to well, you know, you can adopt my stack and then it works. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, here's the thing: in order to do the things people want to do, they're going to need to pull it from everywhere and turn it into what they want, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so, what form of value can we provide mm -hmm. to people on our platform? I mean, the mm -hmm. data itself as the computational platform, such mm -hmm. that they can turn it into something interesting. Now, you can also imagine us just having sanctioned feeds because there are people going out and scraping mm -hmm. other places, and they have di data scientists trying to shut off the guys who are scraping them. So you know, if we had a way to have a real market yeah, sort of yeah. take place there, I think that's the thing. And then at the end of the day, so much of this, it's about action and insight. Right, right, so how do I drive an app and have great action, and how do I let people yeah. just you know drive their own insights? And so, if you think about you know so yeah. many people in front, it's the tools, right? Yeah. How do you get in the BI stack? How do I have people yeah. sit in front of Excel? So you're kind of imagining missing. something like an app store for data feeds, yes, yes. Uh, where you actually, and services, and, yeah, yeah, and people can actually pay, yeah. and you yeah. know, and there's actually competition to say, oh, actually, I have a better yeah. you know service of this kind than someone else. Yeah, it's yeah. an interesting. You know, I've been talking to this guy who's got a machine learning startup for about. Mm -hmm. uh, close to a year, and uh, they've done some interesting models around what we call Salesforce uh, optimizations, like lead re-ranking and whatnot. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the signals that they get, and again, they're one of the folks trying to get scrape stuff from various places. Imagine those uh, mm -hmm. feeds were just available uh, mm -hmm. in a commercial sense in the platform. And then we've got a place where you can run the computation and then a route to market. Yeah. So instead of finding the next thousand customers, they can just kind of go here and you know, subscribe to this module. And the people building things together at that level. So. Yeah, no, that's, that's, I can really see that would be quite yeah. useful. Yeah, and for the yeah. people who can get to see that story, yeah. uh, it's pretty compelling. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about sensors and how yeah. they're changing the game. Yeah. Uh, you know, it used to be that. Uh, uh, you know, data was uh, you know stuff that people typed in on keyboards. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And actually, people used to ask me, you know, uh, what's Web three? And I would say, well, it wasn't a version number, but you know, it was just about the second coming of the dot com after the dot com bust, the second coming of the web. But if it was a version number, it would be when data started. These data services started being created by sensors rather yeah. than people typing yeah. on keyboards. And now that's pretty obvious. Yes. Um, but you know, again, I, I think it's really interesting and important for this audience to understand that the obvious part of that happening on mobile yep. is not necessarily the only or most interesting part. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, like I was, talked to Jeff Immelt recently yep. and GE's been talking a bunch about the industrial internet and mm -hmm. what does that look like, mm -hmm. you know, and how can we get data from jet engines right. for fuel optimization yep. and exactly. how can we, you know, you know, again, you know, nuclear plants talking yep. to, you know, the smart grid is all right. in that space. Uh, but there are a lot of other areas mm -hmm. where you can start thinking about how yep. sensors will change business parking. You know, yep. we sort of smart parking now. Uh, you know, you start imagining, oh, and the, oh, well, that actually could feed over into the, mm -hmm. you know, the the apps. What what if your you know your mapping app also right. had a parking recommendations right. on it? Oh, there's a parking spot around on the next street over. Yeah, you know, that's it, huge. No, absolutely, so it's, yeah. you, and people refer to it by different things. You know, machine born data or whatnot. And, uh, lots of ways of making the point, but there's this thing a few years back, and it was business activity monitoring, and people had to go instrument all the mm -hmm. aspects of their applications and such. Mm -hmm. But now, just being able to harvest the logs and you know do mm -hmm. this information production, 
so many things are just emanating digital signals and events, and we can mm -hmm. use it in various forms. So I, I refer to this but as again, an ambient data. It's yeah, just out yeah. there, and how do we just capture it? And here's the interesting, I get to this point where I, I assert to people the cost of data acquisition has gone to zero. So you mm -hmm. mentioned people used to key, key it in. So mm -hmm. 30, 40 years ago, that's pretty much how it all got there. Yeah. And I looked a couple years ago for a talk I was doing. You can still find people that do that here in the States. It's roughly a yeah. dollar per kilobyte, mm -hmm. okay? Whether it's keypad, you know, data entry or manuscript yeah, typing. Yeah. So it's dollar per kilobyte, okay? And so it's, that's, you know, it works out to be a billion dollars a terabyte. Mm -hmm. If you do the math, roughly. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so people aren't typing this in, and we got terabytes just coming in all over the place, and how do we turn it into value? So yeah, that's well, a, well, that's, I think, where the opportunity is. Yeah. You, you talk about, you know, you, you're talking earlier about the stack, you know, with low-level mm -hmm. data services, mm -hmm. information services, mm -hmm. and then maybe BI at the top. Yeah. Um, but that information services layer seems really important yes. because we're not really there yet. We still have right. a bunch of people. We don't even have data service in a lot of cases. People are kind of down there writing. It's the equivalent yeah. of in the PC day, everybody writing their own driver yep. yeah. uh, still. And, uh, yeah, we do need it to start being systematized. Yes. But I think one of the one of the biggest challenges I see as I talk, you mentioned, you know, how do people wrap their head around? This? Uh, when I talk to a lot of folks, it's unlearning, right? Where's the new value in this new space? So, mm -hmm. as an example of that, um, we get to a tipping point when the cost or the perceived latent value of this ambient data mm -hmm. is greater than the cost to acquire and store it. Because you can just hang on to it and figure mm -hmm. out how you're going to turn it into value. Yeah. So there's this thing, this notion of a digital shoebox, people just throwing yeah. all of these feeds sure. and streams into one place and then only building a model after the fact. Yeah. So when the data warehousing guys encounter this, it makes their head hurt. Yeah. Uh, and so here's a real example. I was talking to folks in the life sciences business, mm -hmm. uh, pharmaceutical, a bunch of drugs that are nearing the end of their patent. And so they want to go back in and look at the clinical trials to see if there are any side effects that are advantageous in which they can basically get new value out of these drugs. Hmm. But all of these clinical trials over decades are in different forms and such. And yeah. just how do they pull it together in a way to make sense out of it yeah. and then turn it into value? That's So if you come from a traditional enterprise yeah. data or housing space, it's yeah. incredibly hard. And yeah. there are these guys who do say there's only one version of the truth. And I look at them and go, no, look, in this, yeah. today's world, there's multiple versions of the truth. What's in your enterprise data or house is valuable. But there's a version of the truth out there in terms of what people are yeah. saying about your products. And there's a version of the truth that's just operational around in all of your processes yeah. are emanating data. And if you're not yeah. turning that into value, you're not keeping up with the next guy. Yeah, so um, that kind of brings up kind of the question in general about how businesses can get more advantage out of yeah. data. Uh, it seems to me that uh, you know it's pretty clear in, say, the tech world that mm -hmm that uh, there's sort of network effects and data that have given right. enormous power to some companies. But I think across every company, you know, there are small or large competitive mm -hmm. advantages to mm -hmm. be gained from data. Yes. Can we talk a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. It's, um, what I find fascinating is that uh, you could make some claim in terms of there's only a very small fraction in terms of the real potential value people, you know, out of data that people are unlocking. So if you go in the financial services space, fraud detection, yeah, th there's a case, or web commerce, some of the optimization there. People have been outsourcing that for a number of years. And now I see both in financial services and in digital commerce, people bringing things back in-house. And when I ask them why, they say, we have signals in-house we've come to realize that we can incorporate that either the third party we've been dealing with doesn't know how to incorporate or we're not willing to share it with them. So, But this notion of they can get so much more value once they wrap their head around how to turn what they have on hand into value. That, I think, is a, yeah. it's, it's sort of a mind shift I think a lot yeah. of these folks need to, to go well, through. When they do, they just find more and more of it. That brings up kind of a... a um, to me a, a key point, uh, which is how you deliver value from it is changing. Mm -hmm. you know, it used yes. to be that there's this sort of notion of the analyst, mm -hmm. and the analyst kind of studies reams and reams of data and comes up with reports and recommendations. Yep. And uh, you know, I see increasingly the move to building in real-time feedback yes. loops as 
the future. And, and you really look at it even in, in by analogy in something like mapping. You know, we start out with a paper map, right. and then we get our first generation online yep. maps, and then you kind of get much more dynamic, better affordances. But the end game is cars that just know where to go. Yeah. And you're not even looking at the report anymore. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. the map as the equivalent of a report yeah. because you just say, you know, go to Joe's house. Yep. You know, and that's where we're headed. Yeah. And in a similar way, you know, you think about, uh, you know, say inventory reordering. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the more sophisticated companies, you know, some, you know, like Walmart, somebody takes something in the cash register and it, you know, it's a trigger. It's an event trigger, just like in a web app. Yep. You know, except it's triggering an event at a factory and in the supply yep. chain versus yep. you know an old school business where you know. I remember in bookstores, I used to say, "Look, you know, this is one of my old hobby horses. You know, shoplifting was a far greater, did far more damage than piracy yep. because you go into a bookstore, they say, oh, yeah, we have it in stock.' You know, and you know, it'd been shoplifted a year before because they did yeah. inventory once right. a year, right. and you, they never reordered because hey, it didn't sell. Nobody could find you know? it in the shop. Exactly, <laughs> you know? exactly. And, and so that whole notion now, of course, of, of you know that that feedback loop, right? You know, and people went to oh, now we're, yep. we're updating because we're you know inventorying yeah. every you know, exactly. You know, it's so true. Yeah, you know? and and the world is becoming more like web apps, yep. and I think that's one of the things that businesses really need to yeah. learn. Yeah, a couple things there. I mean, there's just this reduction in latency, mm -hmm. and you can look at it through so many different lenses, and that's mm -hmm. a key part of this. I, I was talking to a shipping company a couple yep. of years ago, and what are they using their GPS for? And they really, you know, because they had GPS mm -hmm. in the delivery vehicles. Yeah. And they had a couple of things. They said, well, how about the following thing? Yeah. Imagine one day you have an alert that goes off because a driver drove right across the river and got to his customer's you know, delivery 15 minutes earlier. The next day, four drivers go across. The day after that, it's 17. And on day four, you replan your routes because you realize there's a new bridge there. Yeah. Uh, are you able to, you know, react and respond yeah, yeah, that way? Or yeah. do you have to wait six months to get a new DVD from the GIS vendor? Yeah. Right? And it's <laughs> yeah. just, you know, no, collapsing that is, and then when the yeah. models start to tune themselves, yeah. that's another dimension. So yeah, people yeah. who, this is the fascinating thing about this, people who've gotten their head, they've crossed yeah. on the other side. What I see is I look around, once they recognize the net new value, they can just find many more opportunities yeah. for it. So when you talk about the model, uh, tuning itself. Yeah. Uh, who's doing that? Yeah. It's you go up a level mm -hmm. in terms of the abstraction. So lot, I've got several different cases where uh, sort of dynamic models have replaced editors and product planners. And one friend shared a few years ago from uh, Digital Commerce and the homepage where they were selling stuff, there was a weekly meeting where the product planners got together and duked it out and mm -hmm. certain real estate was more valuable than others in the home screen and I want the sneakers here and this way. And they moved to a genetic algorithm where they basically placed product and then measured the response. Yeah. And they would just mutate every once in a while and just kind of go right. from there. So you think about that as one dimension, right. having the system tune itself right. in response. But then you know, we talked earlier about these various dimensions yeah. of context. So now there's a personalization dimension as well. Yeah. So knowing who we are, yeah. right, that comes in as well, and these things start to compile. Yeah, and, and, and obviously, you know, you think about that, and you go, oh, okay, that's what the next generation e-commerce platform yeah. looks like. It do, it's it has that kind of smarts to it. It's right. not just sort of new, you know, yeah. features. You yeah. know, and it's sort of interesting because I, 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 there's so much opportunity to rethink yes. almost every yes. business app yes. that's out there yep. as an intelligent learning app yeah. that closes the loop and yeah. reconfigures itself, learns from its users. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. So what about uh, um, healthcare? We were talking earlier about some work you're doing there. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting, obviously a lot of efficiencies to be gained through healthcare, a lot of challenges. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have done recently um, is patient readmittance. Mm -hmm. There are some changes in the healthcare system where this is going to become really important. People mm -hmm. will be watching over this. And so collected a large volume of data that was available. It was just laying there in ambient form, if you will. And then you know learned a few things mm -hmm. in the large and learned a few things in the small. So in the large, you can say, okay, here's a course of action, two protocols roughly equivalent. Mm -hmm. They were perceived as equivalent. Mm -hmm. And then we realized that if someone comes in with a particular uh, pre-existing condition, those protocols are not equivalent, right? Mm -hmm. One is much better than the other. But you know, applying that statistical lens, I mean, nobody had ever been able to yeah. look at it in that form. So there's sort yeah. of a thing in the large. All the way down to, uh, we saw things in the data where particular treatment, we realized, wow, this room for people who have that procedure, 
their chances of readmittance are much, much higher. And it turns out that it had something to do with the ventilation system in the room. So yeah. uh, fascinating things that you can lift up out of there and a lot of efficiency yeah, for uh, that healthcare. It, talking about those sort of odd little data things that you yeah. learn when you instrument the world and look at the data. Yeah. I had an entrepreneur who's working on a uh, sort of a, a sort of a, it's a, a, a stress watch that you mm -hmm. wear and it talks to your you know your yep. phone or your iPad and records that and he's building stress maps of cities. Mm -hmm. but his target market is soldiers with you know, yep. veterans with PTSD. And he told the story of this guy who figured out, oh wow, it's Whole Foods that triggers my PTSD, Interesting. <laughs> my my, my uh, attacks, you know. And how how odd is that? The guy was, but he was sort of like he could see every time he went in there, yep. his stress was elevated. Yeah. And you know, who would know? Who would think that? And then, of course, working with his therapist, he kind of got, mm -hmm. oh, it's the this this these wide aisles, there's nowhere to hide, right. you know. Right. <laughs> right. Right. And it was sort of like, you know, sometimes you don't even know what you know yeah. until you actually instrument it. But I, I wanted to kind of think a little bit more about this um, healthcare space mm -hmm. uh, because one of the things that it brings up um, is a little sideways. But you know, it's easy to think about the data telling us what to do, mm -hmm. and in some ways, that's a wonderful um, uh, you know trend where we're building mm -hmm. these smart systems. But there's still a role for human judgment and. When you talk about healthcare, I, I, I'm thinking of this guy Paul Levy, who used mm -hmm. to run uh, um, uh, Beth Israel mm -hmm. Hospital in, mm -hmm. in Boston. And what's really interesting is he came in not from healthcare, and he said, "Wow, you know, you know, this is central, you know, these, these central line infections, and we're yep. killing people." Yep. He said, "That's unacceptable. I want the rate to be zero. And they right. said, "Oh no, no, it, it can't be zero. The, right. the, 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 you know, this normal is about you know." I don't know what it was, seven or eight percent, right. and we're at six percent, so we're better. Yes, yeah. I don't care. We're killing people. Yep. I want it to be zero. Yep. And it's sort of very Steve Jobsian, like yeah. you know, I don't give a yeah. damn, you know, what yeah. you guys think is possible or not possible. Right. This is what it needs to be, yep. and you know, in, with that intransigence, he actually got, you exactly. know, to that. Level. And there's something about, um, you know, this really interesting dynamic of, you know, we can't just sort of give up to the data. We right. still have to, exactly. you know, have values and goals. And how do you think about that? Oh, that's a great question. So, <laughs> I have a, so part of my little secret is I have a degree in robotics, not uh -huh. computer science. So okay. in the robotic curriculum I went through, we got some control theory, got a little bit of hardware, a little bit of software, and a lot of, you know, numerical analysis and whatnot. So I think about it, systems, right? And yeah. the ability to like shift a system from one stable state to another. Mm -hmm. And that moving to zero, we've got the same thing sort of in our industry, if you will, these false failure rates. Mm -hmm. Tests that fail in the automated test run that are not really a failure, they're just flaky. The test fails mm -hmm. on you know, February mm -hmm. 29th when it's leap year and whatnot. Yeah. And you tell people it's got to be zero. And they say, no, okay. But the, you use the data yeah. to drive to zero. And as soon as you go from like you know, 2% yeah. down to 0.1%, you're in a different regime, a different stable spot. Yeah. And uh, people will never assume yeah. that life will be so much different there. Yeah. And that's, you need someone crazy to sort of drive it to that, but yeah. the data can help you yeah, get no, there. That's really that's true. A, it reminds me of that wonderful Bill James quote that was in uh, Moneyball, where he said, uh, you know, there are pe there's people who, who uh, you know, above the curve and below the curve, yeah. but data moves the curve. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And I think uh, that's kind of a, a world I'm that we're in, where yeah. actually where we actually can change fundamentally what people expect. Absolutely, and I'm in that world right now because we moved from building a shrink wrap product, SQL Server, we put it on the you know DVD, to running a continuous service, and yeah. the data is just flowing out of this. And mm -hmm. so I've been spending a fair bit of time the last few months in R doing various sorts of exploratory visualization. Mm -hmm. and asking questions. Why do we have this spike yeah. right here only on this data center? People say, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but it, it spurs the right sort of questions and it, mm -hmm. it gives you this lens into behavior yeah, that you can't it just explain mm -hmm. it away anymore. Well, that's the thing that's sort of interesting, that notion of exploratory visualization, yeah. you know, uh, which is really of having visualization be a tool that you yeah. use in development and, exactly. and, and you know, once you've figured it out, yep. you actually change the service. Absolutely. You know, as opposed to that you actually, you know, I think about this in, in, in search engine, search yep. quality teams. Yep. You know, you use effectively visualization and, you know, testing and, and the like to actually figure out if yep. the results are good, but you don't actually tweak the results manually. Right. You change the algorithm exactly. until you get, exactly. you get that 
you know, yes, it's good. So there's this big piece of this, which is I refer to as model generation. Yeah, yeah. And that's you know different exploratory mm -hmm. visualization, exploratory tools there, mm -hmm. and then later on down the, the chain, sort of these explanatory mm -hmm. yeah, sort of yeah. things. So I want to um, uh, talk a little bit about uh, privacy. Yes. Uh, so tell me what you think about that. You, you picked the topic the highest on my what keeps me up at night list. Is uh -huh. that what it was? So, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it's a it's certainly a vexing problem, right? And uh, I don't think that there's a tech solution to it, mm -hmm. um, and I had some combination of policy. And but I think of so many things today are sort of wild west. I don't know what's being gleaned from me, and I don't know how it's being used, and it comes yeah. back in odd ways. I think a lot of it will get straightened out if we think about more things being a fair value exchange in the context of yeah. a trusted relationship. Yeah. And I think that squares away so much of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, although I, I was talking with Helen Nissenbaum, who talks about a lot about that. Uh, she's from NYU, and she's done a lot of interesting thinking about, uh, you know, uh, contextual agree implied yep. agreements. Yep. You know, I gave you the data in this context. Right. So that's the context you get to use it in. You yep. can't use it in some wildly other context yep. without my permission. And I think you can get a, a fair amount of distance with that. But it seems to me there's another class of data that I did not give to a provider at right. all. It simply observed. Right. You know, uh, um, and, and therefore, and there it's, it's you know, I feel like we have these rules that are based on the notion that you can keep people from having data. Yep. And instead, we need to start having rules about, well, what can you do with it once you have it? Right. You know, so like, you can't stop me from recognizing you. Yep. Right. You know, and I don't think you're going to be able to stop me from, you know, say, recognizing right. you with right. computer vision either. Exactly. You know, but what you can do is saying, okay, because you, you can't use my face without my permission in these ways. Right. And you can use it in these ways. And yep. I, I think part of what we have to do is start thinking about, well, what are the harms that we're trying to prevent? Exactly. And then, you know, you look at something like insider trading that works that yep. way. You get people who say, actually, I don't want to know that because yep. then I can't do something that I want to do. Yep. And uh, actually, unfortunately, we have that around patents too. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. I don't want to know about prior art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, you know, I bet there's some fresh ways to think about privacy in this world because there's just so much data and so much you can yeah. infer by overlapping data sets yeah. that it's going to be impossible to you know kind of do something like, oh yeah, you just can't know this. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's vexing in that some of it is counterintuitive. Some yeah. of the techniques that people can use to de-anonymize data. Yeah. They're just you, at first glance. Wow, that's an interesting one. Yeah. and they're, they're just out there. Yeah, that, so yeah, yeah, the notion that you can anonymize it, I think, will it, eventually just fall down. Yeah, and, and so we'll just give up. I think one element is so, you know, who will serve as trusted aggregators. Yeah, and to your point, is you know how can it be used and yeah. you know so. So then again, that gets us back to kind of the notion of an OS and somebody yeah. who basically says, okay, I'm 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 going to centralize the risk. Yeah. You know, actually, we had something way. come up last week on this one. So, we, by for PII reasons, we can't know. Who has what database, if you will, in yeah, the yeah. SQL Azure service? Uh, but we can know that this particular database had a hiccup, and boy, it'd be nice to let the customer know, or they're heading towards a cliff or whatnot. And mm -hmm. um, I said, well, can't we do this such that we're protected on both sides? Let us send a mail to the customer without any of the engineers ever knowing who that was. If somebody registered for that, there's a way that we can send a mail to them. Yeah, anonymously, and say, "Hey, if you'd like to chat more, here's who to contact." You know, yeah, back yeah. here. So we, the system There's needs to evolve yeah. to maintain these sorts yeah, yeah, of sure. social constraints. I want to ask you one last question uh, before we take questions from the audience. When we were talking earlier, you started talking about your personal development practice and the fact that you're using your iPad as a second screen yeah. with eBooks, which I thought was kind of an interesting yeah. pattern. And actually, I wonder from the audience uh, how many other people. Uh, uh, do that as well. Oh, by the way, I should mention, if you want to ask questions, use the hashtag uh, Stratacomp, and uh, they're monitoring here. Yeah, certainly of interest to you. I mean, this is my transition from being a guy in paper yeah. well, to digital form, uh, it's the, the fact that what I know and what I do can be available whatever device. So the times when I, I frankly, I spend a fair bit of time writing code in hotel rooms at night, such so the time I get to do it. And I wind up with my laptop and sort of iPad with a, a book and the other. So it's just in the ability to annotate and have those be synchronized, and it really mm -hmm. has changed uh, the experience. But yeah. All right. Do we have any uh, audience questions, Kirk? What, what are uh, ethical guidelines around the use of big data? I mean, I have opinions about mm -hmm. it, um, you know, and it kind of goes back to the golden rule. 
don't do something you wouldn't like somebody to do to you. Right. Right. <laughs> you know? right. But yeah, I have to get very concrete about that in a business context. Yeah, I think about it sometimes. That technology comes along and just sort of tips the contract. And look yeah. at the printing press, right? Yeah. It, in response, you know, people could just slander. They could write something about somebody and just distribute it, you mm -hmm. know, to everyone. And sort of whether it's technology or policy that comes back to sort of restore the social contract, I think we're going to have both. Yeah. So with respect to the ethics, uh, a lot of challenges here. We were talking about healthcare earlier, yeah. uh, and the concerns there, both in the small and in the large, yeah. are fairly significant. Yeah, the thing I would just say in general, you know, most people want to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a set of bad actors yep. who don't. And Clearly, you need regulatory systems yep. of one kind or another, whether they're government regulatory systems or, um, you know, technical. Right. You know, so you think about, for example, anti-spam. You know, all kinds of bad actors who are, right. you know, trying to do things or antivirus. Those are regulatory systems. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, I was just reading a, uh, you know, article about you know people now spamming, you know. Amazon eBooks with yep. their direct publishing, you know. So, you know, oh, you you, re you heard about that famous book, Thirty Five Shades of Grey, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which was apparently one. You know, people are basically taking riffs off of uh, very popular best-selling yep. titles. Yep. And yep. some, uh, I forget who, somebody has a Steve Jobs biography by somebody or other yep. Isaacson. Yep. And, and yep. you know, it's just like total scam yep. stuff. Yep. And, yeah, you've got to be able to build, uh, you know, regulatory systems right. for the people who. Aren't going to perform, yeah. uh, according to the rules. Uh, but you also, I think, it, you have to not over-engineer ethics because you know this is where people complain about government regulation. You know, the kind of the assumption that everybody right. is a bad actor, and then we end up with way too many rules. Right. You know, and I think it's also really important to let the um, you know system run for a while so you actually figure out what, where the real problems are, and then you put in. You know, solutions, right. which are, have to be dynamic as well. That kind of leads me to this whole notion that I've been playing with about sort of, uh, you, know, you know, regulatory systems that are focused on outcomes, not on the rules. Exactly. You know, when we think about, you know, search engine quality or anti spam, you know, we have a goal, uh, but we're changing yeah, the, the mechanisms rules. and remedy. The mechanisms, you know, you versus yeah. you think about government yeah. regulation, somebody wrote down this rule in 1934, mm -hmm. and we're still following it, mm -hmm. you know, and whether it works or not, you know, right, right. <laughs> it's on the books. Right, yeah, <laughs> so it's super important to specify the intent. Yeah, exactly. Because how we get there will change. And I think that that's really where we need to start yeah. moving towards yeah. outcomes. And again, that kind of goes back to, yeah. you know, we're just, I believe we're at the beginning of this whole new world of thinking about data and how we're going to actually build data services that work, right. uh, that are dynamic, that are evolve, and this huge opportunity for, uh, you know, really the equivalent of an operating system provider so, yeah. to, to tame that wild west, yep. uh, make services accessible for developers in all kinds of different markets right. that just mean that everybody doesn't have to roll it from scratch. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I give you um, the housing crisis of 2008 as example number one, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, you know, derivatives that nobody understood uh, being used to fleece all kinds of people. It gets back to this notion of being counterintuitive. I look at uh, Netflix challenge a few years yeah. back, and uh, I think they did everything right. They tried to do open innovation. They tried to anonymize. They preserve, and yet, you know, and it wasn't in a malicious way, but several researchers were able to go and de-anonymize. So yeah. people can but misuse you know, the, this. But at the end of the day, though, I mean, I would put that in the category. Was that was there really harm there? No, no, the, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That wasn't, but so, there's a potential, yeah. you know, demonstrated yeah. potential for harm, right? And yeah. So it, you it's contrast to your point that around. with, you know, kind of like what, what happened when Wall Street firms, uh, yeah. you know, basically, you know, screw in the rest that's of us. That's uh, where the tech, <laughs> the tech gets ahead of the, you know, yeah, yeah. everything and, else. Yeah, so. uh, um, you know, other misuse of big data. I think, you know, to me, one of the biggest misuses of big data is not to use it. Yeah. You know, you look at our healthcare system yep. with massive amounts of waste right. due to lack of coordination of care. Uh, you know, the, the harm of not figuring out how to use mm -hmm. the data effectively is far greater than the risks of, you know, the more traditional worries about misuse. Mm -hmm. Big data growing other parts of the world in similar pace. Um, I f believe so. I'll tell you one of the things I see is there's adoption, obviously, yeah. 
Um, and you can see differences regionally just within yeah. the states. But I was over in Australia a couple of months ago doing a talk over there. And what I saw there is that in terms of understanding of the technology, you're a little bit behind. But in terms of you know, uh, its application, looking mm -hmm. for real applications, I thought they were fairly advanced. I think the opportunity is global. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I just see the adoption yeah. is where it's going to yeah. take off everywhere. Well, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, the whole lean startup movement is uh, kind of the Bible, Eric Ries's yeah. book and yeah. the like, uh, are really, a, that's what it's about. You know? Yes. Uh, you know, the startup as a machine for learning, and that's all about data. And so that's kind of interesting, because you don't think of that necessarily as being, quote, big data. Right. And, and you know, while big data is kind of a useful term, it's really, you know, data in all its forms. Exactly. Small data, uh, it's just really data intelligence. Yep. How do you build smart learning apps right. that close the right. loop? Yeah, one of the things in this team I was working with last year is to figure out how do we maximize the you know iterations, learning iterations, and mm -hmm. what are we going to try to learn? Yeah. What data are we trying to collect? What hypotenuse? So is it, I, yeah. it's funny because I, we were going through sort of kind of inventing a bunch of this stuff, and then I read Eric's book, and I'm like, this is it right here. I yeah. don't need to yeah. you know. So I, I very much agree with that. Yeah. And you know, I think the whole Lean series that Eric's been working on with O'Reilly really is trying to map that process out into different areas of, of business. Yep. Obviously, you know, in the web space, yeah. right? so they, they are sort of the leading edge. But one of the things I see, financial services. Yeah, obviously, you know, financial. Is, there. Actually, I would say financial is ahead of the web. Yeah, They've yeah. actually been doing it longer. Yeah. And you know. The notion of the quant driving the business yep, yep. has been, you know, hedge funds, all that. Digital but, commerce, another yeah, yeah. one that's going along. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of you know, natural resource planning, mm -hmm. whatnot. If you look at the seismic work that's being done, and what I think is interesting there is you look at the oil and gas guys, they've got these big seismic models they made for a long time, and how do they drive new value from that? So it's a yeah. lot of industries it's really taking yeah. off. And it's starting to take off in just, uh, you know, industrial world in general. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Obviously, you know, supply chain. Yep. I think is you know you look at a company. I I, I wrote a blog post uh, you know, you know uh, you know a few years ago about why you should think of Walmart as a Web two O yeah. company. Yeah. You know because you know everybody was still at that point thinking oh Web two O that's you know Ajax apps. Yes. Yeah. Like yeah. no no it's yeah. about you know infusing an organization yeah. with data. Yep. You know? <laughs> yep. And uh, is there anything you want to you know just highlight before we wrap? I mean, the other thing I would say is, I mean, I've been in the data space for 25 years, and I, there are two things. There's this whole ambient data, and then this machine learning statistical approach, which make this the most exciting time to be a data geek in my career. So, great opportunity for all of us. All right. With that, thanks very much, and thanks for the work that you're doing. Uh, where should people go to, to learn more about it? They can just go look uh, for the data market in Azure. They can start there and kind of spider from there. On the SQL Server website, there'll be some information there as well. Okay, great. Thanks a lot.